Well, hello again, Gary Stearman, welcoming you to another edition of Prophecy in the News. Today we have a very special guest with us, author Ken Johnson. This is his latest book, The Ancient Book of Enoch. It's a commentary. We'll be talking about it in just a moment. Well, Ken Johnson, welcome once again to Prophecy in the News. Thank you for having me back. And by the way, Ken is uh, is an understated kind of a guy. He's a student of Scripture like you wouldn't believe. Uh, he speaks softly, but his books carry a big message. And today we're going to talk about uh, why the Book of Enoch. Why is everybody studying the Book of Enoch right now? You know, it's a book that sort of rested in the dark corners for thousands of years, and suddenly it's popped up, it's back, people are very interested in it. Well, it's really interesting because it, it talks about the fact that it would be uh, addressed to people of the, the last days. Matter of fact, the opening chapter says that it's to the people of the tribulation period. And again, it's not something that's supposed to be added to canon of, of Scripture. It actually says that it's to, to remain um, not part of the canon of Scripture. But the interesting thing about it, I think, is, is the prophecies involved. And there's a lot of specific prophecies about the Messiah. Uh, it talks about the Messiah would uh, shed his blood for our salvation. We have to be saved by believing on his name. Uh, many, many prophecies mentioned in the Bible are also talked about in the book of Enoch. It's got several prophecies for our time period as well. I think everybody uh, knows that the book of Enoch is quoted in our Bible in, uh, by Jude, and let's just start by by uh, looking at. And by the way, I'm looking at a very old copy of my personal copy of the Book of Enoch, and I'm going to read Enoch one nine. Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones. It says in this translation to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works, their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And again, this is picked up by Jude. It's right at the front of the book of Enoch. And it talks about an event that every Christian should be very familiar with. Uh, this, the second coming of Christ, and with him, ten thousands of his saints. In fact, innumerable saints. And I've always thought, I'm going to be in that crowd. It, it, to me, this is a wonderful thing to think about. It's a wonderful idea. Yeah, amen. Uh, it's interesting, the first six chapters of Enoch all talk about the, the second coming and the judgment uh, of the saints, and even mentions the rapture in a couple of different ways. Uh, so Enoch, or Jude rather, actually quotes Enoch in talking about the judgment. Uh, but we get more details in it, and there's, there's other places in Jude that actually allude to things in the first six chapters. Now, wait a minute. I can't let this go by. Even mentions the rapture in a couple of different ways. Wow. You know, the rapture uh, has become kind of a controversial subject. People disagree about when it might take place and how, and, and some people even uh, wonder if there will be a rapture at all. Uh, how does Enoch uh, way into this discussion. It talks about several times that the people that are dedicated to him, that follow his uh, teachings, would be taken away before the, the major judgment comes, which is uh, right before the establishment of a millennial reign. And so it mentions it in several different ways. It's called the mercy, which it's I'll mentioned that way also in the book of Jude and uh, in Peter and a few other places. Uh, one interesting thing that I always thought was interesting is um, in First Thessalonians, when it talks about the rapture, and in Second Thessalonians, it talks about uh, the event happening when we or it is taken out of the midst. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of an odd phrase in Greek, and nobody seems to know exactly what it was talking about. Usually when you have a phrase like that, it's referring to something that everybody knew back then. And it's, it's interesting that Enoch uses that exact same phrase. So I'm imagining that Paul is either quoting Enoch or another source that's quoting Enoch. Hmm. Something that would be familiar, familiar to his own audience in, the, right. in that day. Now, the other thing uh, that the book of Enoch speaks of, and, and by the way, most profusely, is, is the subject of the fallen angels uh, in the old world. Uh, angels 
a, a very dark group of people, rebellious. Uh, they had nothing on their mind but evil and greed and lust. And they came to earth with, I think, the specific idea of setting up kingdoms for themselves on planet earth. And they, they sort of looked at this planet as their own open domain, free for the taking. And they came down and said, here we are. And they bound themselves by an oath, according to Enoch. Mm -hmm. They took an oath upon Mount Hermon, which, which then became known as the Mount of the, of the Oath, a place, sort of a window of opportunity for them. To, let's talk about that just a little bit, because uh, to me, this is one of the major Bible themes. Angels coming in to try to destroy uh, God's plan for man. Yeah, the, the next section in Enoch, uh, basically from chapters 7 to 20, tells the story of those fallen angels. Um, it's mentioned basically in Jude and Peter and in a little more detail in Genesis chapter 6 about the sons of God coming down with daughters uh, of men. Uh, Enoch goes on to describe uh, basically what they did, how they did things. Uh, there, the normal book of Enoch that we have, the complete copy, is from the Ethiopic. And there are fragments of that particular book of mm -hmm. Enoch in Hebrew and in Aramaic found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's actually a uh, secondary piece that's not in the normal book of Enoch, kind of like a lost chapter, uh, which is a lot usually called the Book of Giants. But it details exactly how they did their genetic tampering, which I thought was fascinating. Hmm. It's fascinating, but more than that, it's pertinent because... Uh, we're talking about the days of Noah. And I can remember many, many years ago growing up and, and hearing what was taught in church. And very little of the old world, that, that is the idea of a corrupted old world, was, actually, was taught at all. Uh, the Noah's flood was kind of a uh, <clears throat> almost mythological in proportion. Noah and his sons build a boat, you know, and everybody knows what the boat looks like, and it has a giraffe's neck sticking out of one mm -hmm. window, and it has sheep on, the, the, on one deck and lions on another deck, you know, and everybody knows about Noah's Ark and how the flood came and how Noah was saved. But very few people actually looked behind that and saw the story of the fallen angels, the corruption of mankind, man becoming so corrupt that he had to be destroyed, and then all the prophecy that comes out of that, which is, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And, of course, we argue that we're living in those days right now. Mm -hmm. That being the case, we may be seeing a repeat of, of some of the things that befell the, the days of Noah. Well, we definitely are. We're, we're seeing a lot of genetic experiments now. I mean, in the last 20 or 30 years, it started out with making better crops, and it went to better types of animals, uh, experimental types of animals mm -hmm. for uh, transplants, and then it goes on from there. Well, I remember, uh, and it's probably been about 20 years ago, I wrote an article for our magazine, Prophecy in the News, on how scientists at that time had taken uh, a gen genome or a genetic strip out of a trout and engineered it into a peach. And <laughs> you, why would you want a, a peach that tastes like a trout? Well, that was not the point. The point was that with this particular fish gene in the peach, it could survive freezing. So that if a freeze befell uh, the farmer, his peaches would survive the freeze. And everybody thought, well, this is wonderful. We're, we'll lose less of the peach crop. But it, it made a cold chill run down my spine because all I can think of is if you begin to do this, what else will you do? And the what else, I think, is, is spelled out in pretty great detail in the book of Enoch. Yeah, Enoch, Jasher, several of the old uh, Hebrew text uh, mentions the fact that they did that way back when and it was something that extremely angered the Lord. I remember when I was in high school learning about genetics, I thought, well, that would be interesting to try to manipulate something, make a new type of creature. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that's not mine, that's his. And he doesn't want his things being tampered with. Yeah, he designed them that way for a reason. Right. The angels have a different idea. They think they can re-engineer God's creation. And in particular, 
Satan wants to re-engineer God's creation. And in a sense, uh, that's what the book of Enoch is all about. But it's also about prophecy. Mm -hmm. That is to say, it, in a way that I don't think any other writing does, it looks toward the future. Now, Enoch uh, is a man who lived a long time ago. Let me just lift my Bible up here. And it says here in Genesis uh, chapter 5, verse 20, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. In other words, he had a special relationship with God. He was the father of Methuselah. He lived 365 years and would have lived much, much longer had not God just taken him to heaven. Now, if you read Scripture here, which we did, that's all you find out about Enoch. Mm -hmm. The book of Enoch describes his travels. Let's talk about that just a little bit. In other words, God took him. What does that mean exactly? I remember being shocked when I first read the book of Enoch that Enoch described the process of traveling into the heavens. He, he said, I went to a house, and I went in this house with walls that were hot, but they felt cold, and they were fiery, and yet they were icy. And he said, and I walked in this house, and I looked around, and guess what? The house took off. It flew. Mm -hmm. he, he called it the flying house, basically. And it traveled to the realm of God, and even into the realm of the future, and gave him a view of what was going to happen in the future. And you're saying, wow, science fiction? It almost sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? Uh, in a way, but I mean, you've got the same kind of thing throughout Scripture where a lot of the other prophets would have dreams or visions or be taken somewhere. Uh, Paul even said he doesn't know if he was really in the body or out of the body, but he saw something mm -hmm. and he knew what he saw. And all those things are important for us to know. And in those, uh, that particular part, chapter of, uh, of Enoch uh, begins to tell what he saw and about the judgments of the angels and the things that would happen toward the end of time. Which is interesting that the complete judgment of those fallen angels doesn't take place until, you know, way towards the end of time. And he even outlines in one pr set of prophecies 7,000 years of human history. Mm. Um, the ancient Talmud of the Jews says that the school of Enoch, Enoch, or not Enoch, excuse me, Elijah, started the school of the prophets. And he taught the same 7,000 year plan of history, that we would have 6,000 years of human history in a millennial reign and then a, a great judgment toward the end. So uh, a lot of those things are similar. Now in your book, and by the way, uh, I'm holding the book, it's called The Ancient Book of Enoch. It's, it's just Ken's look at an analysis of the Book of Enoch. And, and by the way, J.R. Church and I did the same thing many years ago, and we were utterly intrigued. And when we'd finished our study, we felt that we hadn't even touched the Book of Enoch. It was so vast. It has prophecies in it. It has ideas about how the earth is run, and, and it has ideas about the plan of God. Mm -hmm. It has ideas, uh, uh, for example, it, there are little vignettes of prophecy. You mentioned one, and I've, I noted it here uh, a moment ago, um, it's chapter 61, in which uh, you can see a, a kind of a vignette of prophecy where Iran attacks Israel. Now, that's current events. That's amazing. It's, it's on the verge of happening right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see the same thing in Ezekiel chapter 38, mm -hmm. where it names a, a coalition of nations, Persia being one. That's the current, the old name for Iran. <coughs> uh, but what's interesting in Enoch, he tries to make it, or it looks like it is uh, a separate uh, war before the Battle of Armageddon, which is mm -hmm. what we normally think of as chapter 38 of Ezekiel. And we see in, in Enoch that Iran attacks Israel. No one really comes to Israel's defenses except uh, God. And at that point, the Lord sends confusion among the Iranians, and they destroy themselves. And that type of thing has happened many times throughout the Old Testament. And you actually see the same thing in Ezekiel 38, this confusion. But you also see the destruction of five, uh, five six of the people through fire. So 
It looks like Ezekiel might be talking about two separate wars of the same, and Enoch is describing separate ones. And you mentioned historical uh, ideas that Enoch touches upon. For example, here, talking about uh, the 12 hours of Babylon to Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, this is a very important prophetic segment of history, very important to the Bible narrative, and you discover quite a commentary in Enoch in, the, in that period. Yeah, it, it starts out really obviously talking about sheep, and it, star it starts off with Adam and Eve and, and those people, and then Enoch, and it gets down to Abraham and all the way down to Solomon. And the, the language is very obvious, and then it shifts form to talk about 70 shepherds, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting because uh, a lot of people have looked at that and thought, well, it's probably just a Gnostic type thing. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, there is second and third Enoch, which has been a uh, Gnostic and a medieval text attributed to Enoch, in which it talks about <laughs> angels doing things, mm -hmm. 70 angels. Uh, but when you realize that it's actually uh, shepherds, much like in the Micah 5 prophecy about the seven shepherds, that uh, rule between the time of uh, the second return of Israel, 1948, and the second coming. Same kind of language, we've got these 70 shepherds, and it breaks them up, and if you actually see that there are 35, and then there's these 12 Gentile powers, and then there's another 23 that rule in sets of 58, mm -hmm. and then 12. And at first you look at those numbers and think, I don't have a clue what we're talking about. But it's very obvious going from uh, the kings of Israel and Judah all the way through the Bar Kokhba rebellion and then the d Gentile powers are exactly as prophesied in Enoch and then when they return they have 23 shepherds or prime ministers that rule Israel uh, in a period of 58 times. Well that tells us number one they're not kings anymore they are elected officials and some of them get reelected. And so it's interesting to me that uh, the Micah 5 prophecy has us now at basically 2013 A.D., about halfway through that, uh, and the Enoch prophecy has us about halfway through uh, those shepherds. So the times of the prophecies seem to be uh, real similar. And so I can hear people now saying, well, wow, that, now that gets my attention. Uh, that something that's happening right now conforms with a commentary in Enoch, and my next question is, as would I'm sure your question be, can you tell anything about the current era in which we live? Does, does this really speak to what's going on right now, and give us some, perhaps some clues as to what will happen next? Oh, I think it, it does quite a bit. I mean, we have uh, several more uh, prime ministers. Of course, we know Israel's not going to be destroyed. We know this upcoming possible war with Iran, if it's very, very quick, it's going to happen like Enoch says, Iran's going to be nullified some way. Uh, we have the, the other wars from Micah 5 that are going to continue mm -hmm. to go on. So there's a lot of prophecies um, that are still yet. And that has nothing to do directly with the rapture or the tribulation period. Uh, some of these are before, some of these are after. And some of these we don't know exactly the time, but we know what would happen. Yes. So it's very, very exciting to me to see prophecy being fulfilled. Well, let's talk then about the period in which we live. Uh, again, remember, when Enoch be began writing this book, the first thing he wrote about was the second coming of Christ. He mentions the tribulation. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, there's no argumentation about it. it. This quite clearly speaks of the tribulation period. Uh, a great uh, number of Christians today uh, either have not been taught about tribulation period or essentially don't want to bother themselves with the idea of the tribulation, but just reading scripture tells us that, that there is a judgment coming, a period of judgment. And most students mm -hmm. of prophecy say that that period of judgment called in the Old Testament the day of the Lord is going to be seven years long. Jesus referred to it as the great tribulation in Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. What does Enoch say about what we would call the Great Tribulation? Um, well, we get the, the seven-year time period mainly from Daniel, and then it's reiterated all the way through uh, Ezekiel and, and the mm -hmm. New Testament. Uh, Enoch doesn't tell us directly it's a seven-year period, but it seems to tell us that there's a period of time. Um, persecutions come and go, prophecies are fulfilled, Israel comes back as prophesied. There's a time when those that follow the Lord are taken away, and then judgment falls. And Those that follow the Lord are taken away. I just, I, you're, you're on my favorite theme, of course, mm -hmm. the blessed hope. 
Uh, every Christian who studies prophecy, I think, is focused on the blessed hope, Titus 2.13. Uh, and, and Enoch, writing all those years ago, before the flood, mm -hmm. talks about what we call the rapture. Right. That's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. It's, um, it's just amazing. It's hard to describe. <laughs> um, just the fact of all the prophecies in there together like that. But he, he very clearly talks about a type of, of the, the people being taken away for protection, mm -hmm. uh, a wrath being poured out, uh, a remaking, so to speak, of the planet, and then a, a great millennial reign. And again, back to some of the prophecies where he actually gives you, there, there's a prophecy in there about the 10 weeks in, in the book of Enoch, in which he takes 7,000 years and breaks it up into a set of 700 year periods each. Mm -hmm. And he gives details on what would happen to each one. And so far, everything's been completely accurately fulfilled. And then the next time period, we have this uh, tribulation period, this second coming and establishment of a millennial reign. And so it's just really amazing. You can actually backtrack that from the Great White Throne Judgment back and give a hundred year time span to approximately when the second coming would be. Now, let's talk for a moment just to kind of get our bearings. My Bible is open to, to the book of Jude, which is only 25 verses long. It's a very mm -hmm. short little letter. And as you all know, I hope you all know, that Jude wrote this on the subject of false teachers. He sat down to write a general epistle and the Lord directed his mind toward false teachers. Mm -hmm. What are false teachers? And we usually think of false teachers, you know, as wolves in, in, sh in sheep's clothing and people that sneak into the church and, and begin to proliferate various false doctrines and so forth. But, but Jude says uh, here in Jude 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath received unto everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. So Jude is likening these false, these fallen angels to false teachers, which they were. And, and this is fascinating to me because you could say, I guess, that the source of all false teaching comes from Satan himself and from those horrific creatures who came to earth and thought that they could set up their own kingdoms. And they were the archetypical, if you will, false teachers. And that, this really interests me. Yeah, it, it, uh, the second section of Enoch uh, talks about the, the, the 200 angels that fell. Mm -hmm. And it actually mentions the type of things that they taught and they yeah. begin to change things around. Not necessarily something that's... Uh, incorrect, but they taught how to make war, how to make war instruments, mm -hmm. things like that, iron, brass, those kind of things. But then they also did perversion of sciences in, into what we would have astrology and sorcery mm -hmm. and things like that. So uh, they are the origin yeah. of the, the, the ancient pre-flood pagan religion, which we know a lot about from the rab rabbis and the other teachers. So that's accurate. And it's almost amusing to me that the angel, one of the angels, and I forget his name, but, but uh, Enoch gives the name of the angel who taught the art of cosmetics to women, the art of eye makeup and making yourself look beautiful. And I cannot help but think of, of all of those Egyptian uh, sculptures and paintings that show the women of Egypt in you know, all the fancy eye makeup, you know, and the... the uh, the queens of Egypt and so forth, the queens of Babylon were just made up to the hilt. And, and uh, all of that dates back to a false te a teacher, a fallen angel who came down to earth and taught the art of eye makeup. Well, that's in the book of Enoch. And it's just a little side note, but it kind of gives you a clue as to what's going on here. It's really amazing that the world is much broader than we think it is. Mm-hmm. Now, let's go to, uh, let's return to the idea of these false teachers. <clears throat> and, and Jude quotes Enoch saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. In other words, this is the end message. And any preacher who has ever preached Jude will stop here and point to his congregation and he'll say, That's you. You're coming back with the Lord. You're one of the ten thousands of the saints who will be coming back uh, with the Lord. Very encouraging idea, uh, a wonderful idea, but an ancient, 
ancient idea. In other words, this was all prophesied thousands of years ago, and it this is to me the strength of of the book of of uh, Enoch. Uh, I don't think it's to be taken as as gospel, and I know you believe the same thing, right? Right. We don't look at it at it as as canonized scripture. In fact, when J.R. and I did a study on it, we thought that we detected places in it that appeared to be insertions from a later period, perhaps a little editorial notes here and there that might not be quite so believable, uh, and you wouldn't give them as much uh, uh, credibility as you would other places in Jude, but but in general, it's a dependable book, and, and take us out on this idea. Can't, should we read, really read and study Enoch? I think we should read and study everything. Uh, we understand that the scriptures are inspired in the sense that they are accurate and are going to be preserved accurate. So the scriptures are 100% accurate. Anything else may have been tampered with. So there may be sections of it that are corrupt in any type of ancient history book, Jewish book, etc. Uh, we just have to rec recognize that if the book of Enoch has verifiable prophecy in it, then at least that one section has not been tampered with. So we need to take it and uh, study it. There's so much more that we haven't had a chance to talk about, but you'll enjoy reading it in Ken's book. It's called The Ancient Book of Enoch, and we're offering it to you for twelve ninety-five plus shipping and handling. Call the 800 number on your screen and order it, and we'll send it right to you. Also, uh, we are uh, making a, as we always do, putting together a special offer uh, for your uh, enjoyment. We have here four DVDs on the ancient book of Enoch, which are DVD studies that J.R. Church and I did some years ago. We referred to those earlier. Uh, $29.95 plus shipping and handling. Uh, together, this would be about $43, and we're making both of these available to you, the book and the DVD set, uh, for $39.95 plus shipping and handling. Just call that 800 number and ask for the Enoch offer if you want uh, both the DVDs and the book, or if you just want Ken's book for $12.95 plus shipping and handling, uh, call that 800 number and ask for this book, The Ancient Book of Enoch. Ken, it has been really uh, pleasant having this conversation with you today, and I hope that we have stimulated a few of our viewers to uh, study Enoch. Yeah, I hope so, too. And we'll talk to Ken again in the near future because he is a very prolific writer. You know, we're living in fascinating days. We're living in days that were prophesied. I really believe we're in the last days, and Jesus is coming soon. Gary Stearman reminding you to keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported program made possible by our many friends around the world. Be sure you tune in every day for breaking news and our daily prophetic news updates at prophecyinthenews.com or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash prophecyinthenews.